Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here today. Can you believe that we're already one quarter of the way through 2021? It's going by really fast, and you know, we all came through 2020, and I think we were all kind of anxious to get through 2020, right? And then we get into 2021, and 2021 has already bought about its fair share of challenges <laughs> as well. And I'm trying to figure out why we're all living on this side of history and that we've, every one of us here have dealt with things that are supposed to happen once every 100 years. You know, we did the, the 100 year flood thing. We had two of them. We had both the 100 and the 500 year flood that, that we've all went through. Uh, we went through the virus, the coronavirus every 100 years. If you look through history, there seems to be some sort of virus that, that sweeps the, across a nation, never before has it all swept through the entire world like this time. And then we have the Arctic freeze in Houston, Texas. Uh, that's, you know, it's probably a 500-year thing, but we've been on that side of history. So I guess our, we're done with it, and our kids are done with it, and our, great, and our grandkids are done with it, and all the way to the great-grandkids, but we'll let them deal with it when it comes to then. But, you know, I mean, all, all of this has obviously, it, 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 it weighs on us. I think we can all agree that all of these different things weighs on us. And the, the, they're, they're saying right now that uh, our country and our world is, is in a time of where there's so many people that are, are depressed. I, I can even see uh, depression on the eyes and faces of people uh, that I work with and people that I, and, you know, I, I see on a daily basis. And you can see that some people are just tired. We're all very, a lot of people are very tired. We're all tired. And some people are mad. I mean, it's kind of obvious to, to look at all the riots that's going on around our country to, to tell you that people are tired, people are depressed, people are bad, but I am convinced that God is setting the ball on the tee for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit to bring us a mighty revival. Revival means to live again, it means to be renewed. A lot of you can agree that you're ready to live again, yeah. that you're ready to be renewed. And, and believe it or not, today we're going to be speaking on the Holy Spirit. I kind of set that up as well. I didn't even mean to, but I did. <laughs> we're, we're, today we're, we're going to continue to uh, dig into our sermon series where each month we're looking at a different branch of, of theology. And today we're going to be looking at pneumatology, not the study of the pneumonia, but the study of the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to be looking at born of the Spirit. And my, my main crux of what I'm going to be focused on today is the work of the Holy Spirit in conviction and conversion. But before we go into that, let's ask the Holy Spirit to step into this place today and to bless us today and anoint the moment that we're in right now. Heavenly Father, we love you, God. You are the king of kings, and you are the Lord of lords, and you are able to do anything and all things. Nothing is beyond you, God. We're coming into this moment believing that you can do things that go ab ab beyond and above the ordinary, Lord. We need you, Lord. We call out to you. We need you to touch our nation. We need you to touch our world. We need a revival. We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to move into this place today where we leave this place not the same people that we entered in that and the people that are watching online, that they can be changed right where they are in their living rooms, in their homes, or wherever they may be, Father God. We're believing for great things. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to visit with us in a mighty way today. In your holy name we pray, amen. For those of us who have lived in Houston, Texas long enough, you can all agree that during the dog days of summer, there is nothing more than a gentle occasional breeze that will come in from time to time. But yet, if you go down to Lake Conroe or if you go down to Galveston, man, the wind will come off of those waters. And if you've got more hair than me, it's enough wind that it will mess your hairdo up. And God's word describes on many different occasions that God's picture and activity of the Holy Spirit is in wind. 
The biblical word for spirit in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, both, I mean, I'm sorry, in the, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, both, uh, signify the word breath or to excel, exhale, not excel with a C, but exhale, hard enough to where you could blow up a balloon, hard enough to where you could blow out a candle, the kind of heavy breathing that you have when you go for a run or you go for a brisk walk or we walk up a, a few flights of stairs and you kind of feel, you know, that oxygen deprivation beginning to happen and you begin to breathe heavy. Uh, the word also uh, in both the Greek and in the Hebrew also signify the blowing of the wind. Uh, a breath, I'm breathing right now, all of you are breathing right now, but none of you can see a breath. It's intangible. It, it can't be grasped by the hand. It, it seems like it's nothing, but breathing <laughs> is vitally important. The thing that separates a person that is living and the person that is dead is that those of us who are living are breathing and those those of them who are dead are not breathing. So we can all agree that breathing is incredibly important. Life comes from God. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is God and is of God. And the Holy Spirit, or the breath of God, is what gives us real life and power in each and every one of our lives. We find the Holy Spirit and the wind of the Holy Spirit being mentioned from the very creation of the world. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. It says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit, say that word, Spirit, for other passages of Scripture that I'm going to read to you that mention uh, about the Holy Spirit being in the wind or being in breath. Listen to Acts chapter 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. John chapter 20, verse 22. This is Jesus speaking to the apostles, the disciples. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. How many want the breath of God to be upon you here this morning? How many of you want the breath of God to be upon this very place that we're sitting at today and in your homes for those of you who are watching online today? John chapter 3 verse 8 says, the wind blows wherever it wants, and this is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. He says, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes or from where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Holy Spirit. That people talk only about Jesus and they never really talk about the Holy Spirit. But yet in the other religious circles, we're all of the focus is on the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. All of the focus is on the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. We'll turn the lights down and just wait and waiting for angels feathers and angels dust and all of these different things that you're reading about. They just want the Holy Spirit to come in, but they don't talk anything about Jesus. They only focus on the Holy Spirit. And that's a dangerous thing too. Because when you look at the, at the ministry of the Holy Spirit, since the very initial day, since the day of Pentecost, it has always been fellowship with Christ that the Holy Spirit has focused upon. The Holy Spirit focuses attention on the Savior, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has a ministry of illumination that wants us to get the reality and see the reality of Jesus Christ and the desperate need that every single one of us need in the Savior, Jesus Christ. And today, 
I want my focus to be on the work of the Holy Spirit as it is experienced in conviction and in conversion. Conversion is an absolute necessity. Without this thing we call conversion, then nobody can be saved. The word conversion means turning from one thing to another. The concept of Christian conversion, according to the New Testament, is turning from sin and turning to God. And that is where we begin to bring repentance towards God. We realize that we're incomplete. We realize that we need help. The Holy Spirit deals with us, and we call on the Lord. It also brings about, about faith where we begin to rise up and have a commitment towards Jesus Christ and we begin to believe in him and who he is. And, and this response of repentance, this response of faith is something that the gospel teaches us is how we find our way to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Since the fall of mankind back in the book of Genesis, mankind has struggled with this thing called sin. We've been gripped with sin, none of us by nature have the ability to seriously take the gospel for what it really is and to turn to God in complete trust. We need help. We need somebody to help us along, and that is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is vital to our conversion. Jesus promised his disciples that it was necessary for him to leave so that he could pour out the Holy Spirit so that people would be convicted and have this thing called conversion. Let's look at John chapter 16, verses 7 through 8. It says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So Jesus promises it, so that settles it. The Spirit is convicting, and the Spirit is converting people. But how does that happen? Because conversion is divine sovereignty. We, the day that we came to trust the Lord is when the Holy Spirit began to draw us and convict us and move us into God. How many of you can remember that day? When the Holy Spirit, you were sitting in a a church or you were sitting at home and you heard scripture being read or or a preacher preaching a sermon or a song being sung and all of a sudden something got a hold of your heart and begin to tug on you in a way that it had never tugged on you before. You begin to feel Holy Ghost bumps that you had never experienced before. I've talked to several people where they said they literally got white knuckles trying to hold on to the seat that they were at as they were calling people to the altar. They felt the presence of God moving upon them in such a mighty way. And I know that if I had some time today, we could line this place up and many of you could walk up and talk about that day where the Holy Spirit began to deal with your heart and a lot of you have been raised in the church And you had heard sermon after sermon after sermon, but all of a sudden in that one day, the Holy Spirit began to get a hold of your heart and you came and you repented and you asked Jesus into your life. This is an act of almighty grace where the Holy Spirit is the direct agent where he illuminates He convinces, he induces new birth, he pushes you towards repentance, and it prompts us to say, Jesus Christ, you are my Lord. Come into my life. Let's look at another passage of scripture in John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. It said, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter into the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. Humans can produce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth 
the spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say that you must be born, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Verse 6 gives the reason why a second spiritual birth is necessary at conversion. Look at verse 6 again. And this is Jesus talking. This is talking. He's, um, um, he's saying humans can produce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Jesus here is saying that your human birth makes you human. But when you are born of the Spirit, you enter into a new dimension of supernatural life where you begin to have new loves. How many of you remember that you loved everybody the day, the day that you got saved? You have new inclinations. You have new goals. You have a, a, a supernatural life enters into you that was not there before, and you have a new allegiance. In other words, a new person was literally born. The apostle Paul terms for the person that are after the, after the new birth, he separates it and calls it the natural man and the spiritual man. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them, them because they are spiritually discerned. How many of you have people that you're witnessing to right now and you are just pouring into them and pouring into them and pouring into them and they just don't get it? You get it and they don't get it and you don't understand why they don't get it. You get it because you have been filled with the Holy Spirit of God and it is no longer foolish to you because the Holy Spirit has illuminated your thoughts. He's giving you a new way to think. You are now reborn, so you are seeing things in a fresh, new perspective. So Jesus and Paul are essentially saying the same thing. That which is born of the flesh is a natural man. The natural man does not have the natural inclinations just to believe in God and to believe in everything that Scripture says. Whereas the spiritual man, when we receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes into our life, we all of a sudden have a supernatural change where we begin to believe the things of God. And if God's Word says it, we believe it. We believe something that we didn't believe before. So until we're born of the Spirit... We are only a natural person, and a natural person doesn't have the abilities to believe the things that a spirit-filled person believes. It changes you. It makes you completely different. Through history has shown that when the Holy Spirit enters into a place, that change happens, and we call this revival. We talked about it a few minutes ago. Revival means to live again. Revival means to be renewed. I asked you earlier, and I'll ask you again, how many of you want to live again? How many of you need to be renewed? How many of you, in a sense, need a spiritual reset? You know, the, the, some of the best ways to fix a computer or a phone is just to turn it off. Right, Jason? You just got to turn it off. And you turn it off and you reset it and it just comes back and it's better. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do for many of us here today. The Holy Spirit wants to renew us. It wants us to begin to live again, to get skipped again in our spiritual walk with God. Through history, these revivals that I'm referring to have been known to completely change a city, to change a state, to change a nation and to change the world. We know about the, the initial first outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we read about earlier in Acts chapter 2. But there were other revivals through history. And the first one that really kind of separates itself, that was really kind of the really first outpouring of the Holy Spirit since the day of Acts, happened in, 19, in 1734 in Northampton, Massachusetts. 
That was a mighty revival that changed that city and went on from that city and went all over through the United States. We read about the Welsh revivals, the Azusa Street revivals, the Brownsville revivals of the 1900s. And all of these revivals was not just a one-time deal, not a a one-day thing where it just happened in that day and then it didn't happen again. Those Holy Spirit revivals lasted for weeks, months, and many of them lasted for years. And people that were part of these revivals will write that the supernatural power of God was so real that people that were sinners were crawling into the church and coming to the altar and asking God into their lives. And people that were believers began to see God in a fresh and a new and a profound way. And they were changed forever to where they will never be the same again. And people entered into intercessory prayer where they were literally grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar like we read about in the Old Testament and saying, God, I'm not going to let go until I hear from you or until I, I get what I'm asking you to do in my life. And people's prayers were supernaturally being answered because of a revival. And these revivals were not a reflection of a person's personality. They were not the reflection of a person that who's a good preacher. They were not the reflection of a person who planned for it. This was all outpoured by the Holy Spirit and all the glory went to God. That's when you know that it's a real revival. It doesn't reflect on a person or a plan because God gets all of the glory because only God can do what the Holy Spirit can do through this thing we call revival. And man, should a Holy Spirit revival pour out to Christ Family Church? I can tell you right now that there will be disruption, but it will be disruption for the best. And lives will be changed, and all of the ministries of our church will be changed. And we can enter into a a massive revival where lives are being changed, and people are coming to call Jesus Christ their Lord. The Holy Spirit takes an ordinary person and list them to above the ordinary. See, we live, we live in here on the earth, and there, in a sense, we have to live by natural laws. There are certain things that we can do and we can't do because natural law won't allow us to do certain things. But let me remind you that God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, does not live within the confines of natural law. God can go way above and beyond natural law. We, we read of different circumstances in Scripture where he went above natural law. We see that in the burning bush, a bush, a bush burst onto fire and it didn't get consumed. That is going beyond natural law. We, we see the parting of the Red Sea where, where an entire waters were completely parted in the where for years and years and years it had been muddy water. It was suddenly dry and they were able to walk across it. Read about the fiery furnace that goes beyond the natural law where people were able to stand in a fiery furnace and not be consumed. We read about the day where Jesus turned water into wine. I think some people would probably like to be there on that day, and I'm sure it was the best of wine that you could possibly imagine. But Jesus was able to turn water into wine in an instant, no fermenting, no waiting for it. It happened in an instant. He did beyond natural law. He walked on water, defying physics. Jonah was in the belly of a well for three days. That had to be absolutely gross. But he was in the belly of a well for three days. That goes beyond what natural law can do. And so it is with us that are filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 3.11 that I need to go because what's coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. How many of you want to have a fire in your belly again? How many of you want to be full of the Holy Spirit where you are going above and beyond the ordinary? The possibilities for a person that is full of the Holy Spirit is beyond human comprehension. But before a person can live this spirit-filled life, he or she must become a new person. Thorn bushes don't produce figs. Apple trees don't produce olives. And a natural man cannot produce faith. He cannot do it. This is how Paul said it in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. 
It said that those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful, sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. I don't think that we, we give the Holy Spirit enough credit when it comes to this thing called conversion. If you were to look at Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it will tell you that three thousand people come to know the Lord. They were convicted and converted all in one day. They were added to the church after the first day of Pentecost, after the ascension of Jesus Christ. How did the Holy Spirit convict them? How did the Holy Spirit convert them? Well, we know by reading through Scripture in Acts chapter 2 that there were 120 people in the upper room. Scripture tells us that those 120 people experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But the 3,000 people that were convicted and were converted that day, they were not in the upper room, and they were not filled with the Holy Spirit the way that those in the 120. So how were they convicted? How were they converted? They were convicted and they were converted through the words of the apostles. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Verse 37 through 38, it said, when the people heard this, and let, let, let me talk real quick about what the people heard. They heard, the, they heard Peter in the first 36 verses of Acts chapter 2 talk about the Bible. He talked about, he talked about the, the, the prophets of the Bible. He, he, he quoted scripture from the prophets of the Bible. He talked about Jesus. He talked about the Messiah. He was quoting them scriptures, telling them Bible stories that, 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 you know, that they had read and heard, and they were perplexed in their hearts. Let's go ahead. It says, he, he, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. What does that mean? It means that they were, they were convicted. And they said to the Peter and the apostles, brothers, what do we need to do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and go, to skip on down to verse 47, it says, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. One cannot, for Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith, you got to have faith, right? Comes by what? By hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the word of God. So one is convicted, one is converted, and one is saved when he hears and believes the word of God. What does 2 Timothy tell us about God's word? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says all. Does that say all or some? All. Say that with me again. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. That's the conviction part. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do right. So if the word was inspired, who inspired the word? The Holy Spirit. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. When we tell you these things, we do not use the words that come from human wisdom Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit. Say that word, Spirit. Using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. Remember we talked earlier that the natural man can't get into spiritual truths. Only the Holy Spirit can take us into spiritual truths. So you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to speak about spiritual truths and to understand spiritual truths. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Above all, above all, <laughs> more important than anything else, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or of human initiative. 
No, again, through the word of God, we obey the truth of God. And when we obey the truth of God, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and we become a new person called a new birth. Amen. The Holy Spirit is a voice that will tug at you sometimes. How many of you have ever felt like you've been tugged by the Holy Spirit? How many of you have ever felt like you've been kind of pushed by the, by the Holy Spirit? Touched by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never make you do anything. But the Holy Spirit will try to lead you and to guide you to make the right decisions and to do the right things in life. And here we are in this place today, and I promise you, the Holy Spirit is here. And I have no doubt that the Holy Spirit is nudging, pulling, guiding, and touching a lot of you here today to step out and to do some things. I also am convinced, if you're watching from home or if you're here today, that there are people that, that God is, is, is nudging on today, pulling on today, speaking to today to make some changes in your life so that you can get back to the person that God has created you to be, to recommit yourself to the Lord, to quit listening to the voices of the world and to quit listening to what the news is telling us and begin to listen to what the Word of God is telling us. We know some good news And we need to be proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. We all have an unbelievable destiny. We're going to be in heaven forever and ever and ever. Someday with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every one of us have a a mansion, a crib, whatever you want to call it, of our own, that we're going to go be in someday. There are others that may be here that are listening online today that have never accepted Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior. And I feel in my heart that God is tugging, pulling, pushing, nudging, touching some people here to step into this realm and to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to where you'll never be the same again and that where you'll really begin to live again. This is a holy moment that we're stepping into, not just for those that have never accepted the Lord as their Savior, but for those who need to make a recommitment, for those that are tired, for those that are depressed, for those that need to be renewed, for those that need a revival, that need to begin to live again. This is that moment where we can step in and the Holy Spirit can begin to minister and begin to change and do what only the Holy Spirit can do. You can read all the self-help books that you want to read. You can take all the meds that you want to take, but nothing can do for you what Jesus can do for you. I want to take this moment. I'm going to ask that all heads be bowed and all eyes be closed and I'm going to say a prayer, and I ask that you you say this prayer with me today. Heavenly Father, I give my life to you. You are my Lord, and you are my Savior. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me. Make me pure. Make me holy. Make me acceptable unto you. I want to be full of the Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill my cup. Fill it to the top. Let it run over, Lord. I accept you as my Lord today, God. I love you, and I believe in you. In Jesus' name I pray. 